Uh, today's discussion is a user experience discussion rather than a technical how-to. I would describe it more of a what the heck or why did you rather than a how-to. So let's get started. Uh, I've been uh, an OpenBSD user for more than two decades. Um, I am a port maintainer for literal handful of ports. Um, for those who may not be familiar with that porting, that is the uh, packaging of applications for the operating system. Doesn't take a huge amount of skill. Uh, I consider myself a fan and a hobbyist of the BSDs, particularly OpenBSD, and I'm an, also a fairly active participation, uh, participant on an old forum called Demon Forums, which is primarily OpenBSD focused. Occasionally we get a few other uh, BSD and Linux type users there. Um, I have been an IT professional since uh, God first created the earth. Um, started as an applications programmer, which I guess now the job title would be developer. Um, I have been what I, I suppose is now called a sysadmin. I've been a systems engineer and then in various forms of management over many decades. Um, including mergers and acquisition, a uh, specialty for information technology. Uh, and uh, I've also worked with network-centric warfare and a lot of odd things. But from a BSD perspective, I am nothing more than a hobbyist. The agenda today has got three parts. I'm going to talk about VPNs very generally. This used to be something that was confusing to people. Now, with all of the commercial VPN space, Usually not, but we'll talk about those and then a wire guard in particular. Then <clears throat> what I did in the first couple of years with wire guard, um, which was a big all or nothing switch for me. Uh, and then um, Solan Rapin uh, produced a guide on routing domains, which I read and a light bulb went off. And for me, this has been very helpful because I had been using a WireGuard solution on Android on my phone where I could pick and choose which applications would use it or not. And I wanted that capability in OpenBSD and did not have it at the time. So her recommendations are what I applied here. And actually I just had an email conversation with her this week where she asked me a question. So we're, we're mutually beneficial one to the other. Uh, if you're not familiar with her work, um, she's a very prolific guide writer and OpenBSD developer. So just getting into uh, specifics with, or generalities with VPNs, they're a methodology for moving private information um, as if it's a small private network over a public internet. And that's really what the value they provide. They use cryptography to do so. I'm not going to get into any details on cryptographics today. Just keep in mind that there are multiple mechanisms for protecting information with cryptography. VPNs developers have choices. VPN users sometimes have choices. Uh, and I happen to be using WireGuard because it's a relatively flexible and simple implementation. And having been a manager, and not really a technician for decades, I need something simple in order to use it. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is this classic picture that you see here is got a client server model. And while that is often used with WireGuard, you do get peer-to-peer -peer capabilities and you can design a network with any kind of topography you want under the covers. So there are really two types of implementations, and this is how I think of it. There's a kernel implementation on the right and a user land implementation on the left, and I've picked a couple of very common examples for that. My first introduction to provisioning my own uh, VPN was with IPsec and OpenVPN I'd had some only minimal experiences with um, at the time. Uh, and I think to this date, OpenVPN is still a user land implementation and IPsec is generally kernel because it was a, a subcomponent of IPv6, which got extracted and used in IPv4 implementations quite heavily. 
So there's not a whole lot of difference between them other than one thing, it's a kernel driver doing it, and the other, it's an application program doing the work. Uh, and then for our purposes today, which is routing of traffic, um, the application can do it itself on user land. Generally with the kernel, you're left to whatever the OS has for routing uh, selections and choices. And for those of us who use uh, user land applications with network stack uh, points, of, points of contact, uh, tunnel uh, pseudo drivers, pseudo devices are often used for that purpose. So if you have a, an open VPN uh, system, for example, you will operate it or have it connect to your uh, protocol stack through a TUN device. I chose WireGuard primarily because five years ago it was suddenly available as a kernel driver on, open on OpenBSD and was a very simplistic implementation. And it's relatively recent. It's only about eight years old, maybe seven. And I've been using it for five years. So it had been around for a couple of years when I uh, first began playing with it and said, hmm, this is going to work for me. Um, its physical transport is UDP, which is a relatively well understood protocol as part of the uh, default TCP IP stack. And for me, it was very simple to provision and to deploy it. Uh, there are a variety of implementations. I wanted it across the multiple OSs, Windows, Android, OpenBSD in particular were the three I was interested in. And at the time I uh, first deployed it, it was available for all three. On OpenBSD, what got me interested was a very simple kernel implementation uh, with the development of a, a pseudo NIC, a pseudo device driver, WG for WireGuard. And I had already had lots of familiarity with pseudo device drivers on OpenBSD. Every user who has a network stack and is doing communication eventually uses one or more. And I probably have used more than half a dozen of them. Even today at home, I'm using Trunk and Carp on this very laptop. I also use VLAN because, well, I have about nine <laughs> VLANs in a small, I have more of them than I have rooms, I, I should say. So it's a very common and familiar tool for me. Um, I did mention that VPNs can be peer-to-peer. -peer. WireGuard has a peer-to-peer um, configuration and provisioning system. Um, and therefore you can build point to point solutions, which I've done. You can build mesh solutions, which I've done. And you can use star solutions, which I'm currently using a, on a day-to-day -day basis where it's effectively client server. Uh, and I also liked very much having been stuck with residential cable modem uh, or the DSL uh, systems. Um, having the ability to have IPv4 or not on my local service provider, I could still have tunnel either or both uh, V4 or V6, one to the other. Uh, at the time of its implementation, uh, WireGuard was seen, seen by at least the cryptographic community as having an interesting set of useful uh, primitives and protocols. And one thing I do know from having taken a cryptography class is I never want to roll my own. So I was happy to use, for example, the 25519 or, and ChaCha20 uh, -cha and so on without having to uh, do anything to select between them. I want to just point out that there is uh, there's a, a yay or a nay um, with uh, the uh, wire guard, there's no certificates, which means all the complexity of X509 disappears. That also means there's no expirations. There's no revocation lists. Everything for key management is left to the admin. Uh, all the keys are 32 bytes long. Um, and for simplicity's sake, they're just rolled up in a standard ASCII string and public keys are derived automatically. However, um, with WireGuard, you wanna keep public keys private. They're used to identify peers to each other and that's their sole, really their sole purpose. Um, you also have the ability, an optional but recommended uh, pre-shared key that you uh, route securely back and forth be between uh, peers. Um, 
for, and I loved this, limited non-forward secret, post-quantum resistance. I have no idea what that phrase really means, other than it's perceived uh, that this may have some resistance to cracking in a post-quantum world. Um, your guess is as good as mine what that really uh, is, phrase is really intended to explain. Um, there are now lots of third-party admin tools to help manage uh, the keys because WireGuard by itself does not. But for me, with a half a dozen peers, I, I really didn't need any of these tools. I've never tested any of them. I went poking around this last week or two just to see what they were. And there's a lot of different tools to help manage um, multiple keys, the addition of uh, and, and deletion of keys, for example, for employee onboarding and offboarding, all of that stuff that I would never require. So I have not tested them. And then I just wanted to share with you a typical wire guard configuration because it is a pseudo device uh, with OpenBSD. Um, for example, a host name for WG0, you have the private key for this platform peers that you name by their public keys, and then you define configurations such as allowed IP addresses, endpoint connections for when you want to initiate a, a, a connection between two, two peers, and even the, as shown at the, the third peer line down, a pre-shared key. You then configure private addresses or um, unique local addresses, in, and you're done. And then the uh, public keys are generated by, uh, for at least in OpenBSD, they're, they're generated by the system. So if I want to know my public key to share it to somebody, I can ask for it and then submit it securely to the remote uh, peer. Um, in my first two years with WireGuard, I had a big on and off. And I did that by routing by priority so that when VPN was not operational, it would use the physical network. And when it was up and running, I would use the tunnel, just routing through it rather than routing through the default. And just keep in mind, um, my understanding of VPNs is that they route private traffic over our public networks. So my decision initially was based on my then perceived requirements in 2019 or so, uh, what I thought I needed and how I thought it might function. Um, and honestly, that choice was based on my own experiences with VPNs and my ability to route. So let's take a look at my routing experience. I'd used route out before. So I'd use the route command, Woohoo! And I could describe the general premise of how routing worked for TCP IP, that it was a next hop. That was the limit of my routing experience. My VPN experience, I'd had two different types. I'd been running IPsec point to point uh, between uh, Bastion server and uh, workstation or laptop. And I'd played with OpenVPN once, which is now more than 20 years ago. <laughs> Um, I had been an end user of, oh, at least a half a dozen, maybe more than a dozen uh, various VPN clients that throughout my career. But that, again, was to go into a, uh, a corporate private network through the public network. So that was uh, a little bit different than the use of WireGuard here. So what I decided I needed based on all of that was a default route over the VPN and a backup default route whenever the VPN wouldn't be available. Oftentimes for me, I needed to make sure that, that it was available, but I didn't have um, tooling to test and check and alert me when the VPN was down. I just didn't want repeat emails or other kinds of notifications occurring. So I never, never bothered to set that up. And I needed a specific route from my network to the remote gateway uh, through the public network in order to have command and control over the VPN. So routing by priority, which when I looked at it, looked pretty simple. Um, just that the numbering scheme was a little bit 
uh, odd to me. The lowest priority route at the time that I had was a default route. And so what I decided to do is set medium routes for uh, my default to the VPN uh, and a high priority route for the physical connection to the endpoint. So implementation looked pretty easy and actually was. Uh, adding a priority option on a route add, and I'd already used route add once or twice before. And I had my big switch, which I set up as an alias if config WG0 down and up. The lower the priority number, however, in routing, these the higher the priority. So priority one was reserved by the kernel. Priority two was the highest I could set as an end user or as an admin. And then the lowest priority was I think 15, yeah, there were 16 numbers. Um, right now, uh, our default routes on OpenBSD are priority eight. I think when I first set this up, they were 12. In any case, I set up a, uh, a typical default here for um, the real route as priority two and my uh, use the VPN default route as a higher priority than my physical default route. Seven is still today would work because the default route is eight. Uh, for those who don't know Solane, she, uh, she produced this terrific guide on setting up WireGuard with OpenBSD. And in it, she recommended setting up routing domains. Uh, I can't tell you how much this meant to me because it enabled me just at the time that I was looking for a new solution. It, this her guide enabled me uh, to obtain that, which was application level control over whether or not I was using the VPN. It was really that easy. So for me, I needed application granularity, and I also needed something that would immediately tell me if the VPN was up or down, and clearly not being able to communicate would be one way to do that. Um, so what was recommended and what I deployed was a standard routing domain and routing table and, the, and physical network on a different routing domain, different routing table. Uh, if you were to use the man page on OpenBSD and look for our table or our domain, they come to the same man page. And it can be confusing what the differences are. The way I think of it, and I'm probably wrong, but the way I think of it is a routing domain is assigned to a network interface. And the network interface can only belong to one routing domain. And when once that is assigned, it will use that routing table associated with it. So I think of it as the routing tables are initially assigned to the domain and in the event that, that that NIC is removed from the domain, that table will then revert to zero and be an alternate table. But I've never used a multiple routing table in a single domain. Um, so the way I've set this up is my physical networks are connected via domain one, and my default domain is domain zero, and that runs through WireGuard. I can, just through route exec, which I have alias, I can say this application goes through the VPN, that application does not. So as an example, I can run Firefox. If I were to start from the shell, Firefox by itself would run by default through the VPN. And then I can run Chrome without the VPN by having this little uh, alias, or in this case, I'm just showing you as a simplified, simplified script that I can route Chrome through dom routing domain one, which would not use the, uh, the VPN. And then I think I'm still to this day using a, a small shell script just because it makes provisioning of my window manager a little bit easier. I have, this is what you're looking at here is the output from my trunk um, pseudo device configuration on this laptop. Since I use wired uh, EM0 and wireless IWM0 network interfaces with failover, um, that's what it actually looks like. And here's an example of one of the two physical network interface configurations. All I do is assign it to our domain one. 
and do the same thing for uh, the wireless configuration. I do need a local host, a loopback uh, network on the R domain so everything works properly. So here you can see my physical uh, uh, routing domain, R table, R domain one has a uh, an L01. And then in the wire guard configuration, I've added something called WGR table. This is the secret sauce. Uh, and it allows me to say, on regardless of the domain assigned to my wire guard network interface, the uh, routing table I'm gonna be using it for physical communication is a different one. So this is how I, if you will, use or tunnel the uh, VPN through the physical domain. This is uh, output from Netstat from my domain zero. As you can see, I've got a default through the domain, which is a RFC using just looking at uh, IP version four here for simplicity's sake. I've got a default gateway, which is the RFC 1918 address of the remote gateway 99.1. And the address locally here is 99.3. That's my entire um, R domain zero in ver version four. If I take a look at the uh, R domain one, routing table one, now I've got some more information here. I've got a V port, uh, uh, the 164 address near the bottom, that's for managing our, the guest virtual machines. And I've got my trunk, physical trunk, which is uh, on a different RFC 1918 subnet 1001 with its own physical gateway and the, the address of my uh, local laptop at 1130. Um, I do uh, pass my guests through and net them through our table one. So I'm using two features of PF here. Um, the on our domain one is a check to make sure that that uh, traffic on domain one will apply. Any traffic on domain zero does not. And then uh, the R table one at the end of that pass uh, will allow me to transfer between uh, domains. But in this case, I'm using it just to ensure everything stays uh, uh, on non VPN for my guests and they're natted. I do have two copies of Unwind running on this laptop. Unwind is a, res a resolver um, that can do uh, DNS uh, uh, over HTTP or uh, DNS over TLS, which I think is how I use it. And I have one copy of, of Unwind running in each R domain. So I have a duplicated uh, startup file uh, and run both. And with my uh, startup script, I've got the second copy running in our domain one. So one of the things I do like very much about WireGuard is that you're the owner as the admin, you're the owner of the network topology. If you set up an endpoint and a receiving port, you can communicate and initiate conversations between peers. You can be a complete server and never initiate, or you can go bi-directionally with it and in any pattern or topology you would like. I do run it currently with half a dozen different platforms. Um, I think I've got four OpenBSD and one Windows and one Android. Um, one thing to note is when you have an allowed IP, this is a lot like a filter. It is a filter of what traffic is permitted and when I first started using WireGuard, I confused myself with this. So it's by the source address on tunneled traffic. And you do need at least one address block. They can be sing single address or they can be a complete block. And as an example for inbound from my gateway to the laptop, my allowed IP is the entire internet. And I have both an IPv6 00 and an IPv4 00. 
so I don't filter those packets inbound. Um, that was pretty quick. Any questions about my experiences with routing domains on a simple little laptop? Ask us without you. Oh yeah, no. The the ceiling mic is very lively, so you you. Uh, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, Tatra. I'm sweet here. Um, one of the things I love about the routing domains is the way, you know, if you were trying to do this in IP tables, where if a packet comes in an interface, and then you want to reply, like if you have two ISPs or two separate ISPs on a router. Mm -hmm. Keeping them on different routing domains just means that the packets received on one are always replied to on that routing domain. And it just makes it for a couple of lines of config, it makes it really elegant it's just to, you know, to keep the traffic that was meant to be coming in on one interface to keep it going out of that interface, all the reply traffic. So just I think I would agree with you that the our domains are super elegant solution for that. It's interesting you mentioned that because when our domains were published. I didn't think it would ever apply to my situation. I mean, we're talking about using them on a laptop. And I had perceived these to be, well, if I have a string of routers, here is how I'd like to manage it. If I had multiple um, ISPs that I was using, I could route traffic elegantly between them or isolate customers in a commercial environment in somewhat of the way that, that ISPs themselves do it with Q and Q. I had not perceived that I would be able to take advantage of our domains and routing tables in something as simple as a tiny little ThinkPad. I was uh, astonished and I was very grateful to Celine for really opening my eyes that that was possible. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Joshua. Any, any, any other comments or questions today? Great introduction. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, your next session, I think, is the closing session. Yes. Thank you very much for attending today. And I hope that you have a safe, uh, safe travels home. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.